Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. This is the Little Bean and Me podcast channel. My name's Kayleen and I'm your host. And again, it's been a bit of a break since last time I uploaded, but I did want to come on here and just kind of give you an update of where I'm at and what's been happening uh, with Little Bean and what's been happening with me. <laughs> um, and I hope that you guys are all doing well and I hope that um, you know, you're enjoying your summer. So if you're not interested to hear, you know, personal life or, you know, what I've been struggling with lately, you're welcome to skip ahead. I'll put a timestamp here on the screen for you. Um, but if you are interested in hearing about that, you know, I'll just kind of get into everything. I just wanted to touch base a little bit about, you know, what's been going on with my depression and what's kind of been going on in my own headspace and what's you know, the things that I've been struggling with trying to get Little Bean up and running again. So for those of you who might be new, uh, welcome to the channel. <laughs> this might be a very unusual podcast video to watch first thing, but, um, you know, I just have to be honest with how I'm feeling and what I've been doing and what I've been trying to accomplish. Um, so for those of you who are new, again, um, my name's Kayleen. I am the independent yarn dyer behind Little Bean Loves Yarn. This is my podcast space. I use this channel to kind of share the crafting things that I've been working on and also share with you guys the, um, different things that I've been doing, not yarn related, and also the things that I've been dyeing for my shop. Um... And in the last year and a half, two years, it's been a really big struggle of mine to, to be able to push through depression. So um, earlier this year, uh, the last podcast that I did upload, I did talk in depth about the struggles that I've been having with depression and that I got help and I'm still getting help and I am on medication which has been wonderful it's it's been such a good tool in my tool belt to really get a handle on what I what the core struggles of mine have been um, but there's been a lot of challenges in being a stay-at-home mom which I am and also a small business owner uh, in dealing with mental health problems and also trying to grow and balance and kind of even restart a business that kind of got pushed to the side. So in general terms, uh, Little Bean has kind of been fading off um, in terms of social posts. Like I haven't been on social media all that often. My goal here on YouTube really is still once a month and I think that goal is attainable. It's just taking me many, many small steps to get there just because of my mental health problems. <laughs> so um, for those who also struggle, that chair is probably very loud. <laughs> so for those of uh, you who also struggle with depression, um, you might be able to relate to some of this. For those of you who do not struggle with depression or anxiety or anything of that nature, maybe it'll be a little bit informative uh, for you, if you have a family member or a friend who you know that struggles with depression, to kind of get a little bit of insight into what actually happened. So, um, ironically, I have a degree in psychology, like so many other people, but um, I also worked in human services. I also worked in a laboratory, a neurological laboratory. I have a lot of education around mental health. I have a lot of experience in dealing with people with different mental health issues and also different developmental health issues, like whether they're neurotypical or not neurotypical, all of those things. So I have a background in that. And often in my own personal life, I would not necessarily be my own therapist, but I would be able to successfully talk myself out of an irrational pattern of thinking or, you know, have some kind of insight into what's going on with me. I'm a very, I don't know, introspective, I think is the word I'm looking for. I'm an introspective person. And so having uncontrolled depression really is a different lens altogether because you're no longer able to rationally look at what you're thinking or what you're doing. You don't really have the same level of control over, you know, your choices and what you're doing because depression is not just I'm sad. It's not just I'm feeling down. It's it's a level of 
depression. I mean, like lowered activity all around. And for me, like I spoke about in the last podcast, it was a lack of energy, a lack, a lack of want to do anything, you know, very scary thoughts, especially when it was uncontrolled. I'm in a safe space. I am not, you know, in any way suicidal, but I won't deny that I had very dark thoughts um, last year. And so coming out of that and getting on medication has been very helpful, but it's been very frustrating at the same time because I still have learned patterns of behavior that I developed when I was depressed in order to cope with the depression and cope with living life and having, you know, normal day-to-day activities, never mind dealing with the business, but also, um, you know, I I still have those habits. And they're not all healthy habits. And some habits I have are longstanding habits that I've had my entire life, but some of them really have been like a protective mechanism for me in my depression. So so a couple of things that really I've been struggling with is um, dissociation. So, and I don't use that term loosely or lightly. I really mean dissociation. I, I, where if I am presented with a level of stress that for some reason I'm not able to handle, I tend to move toward, instead of facing the stress and coping with it, I tend to move in the other direction. So like fight or flight. So I end up going into the flight direction where I'm very comfortable, literally just zoning out and like not being in touch with what's actually happening around me kind of checking out, so to speak. And although when I was very, very depressed, it was a a better coping mechanism for me because I was able kind of to preserve myself, my mental health, at least in some ways. Now that my mental health is more stable and my depression is controlled, like I don't consider myself actively depressed anymore. Having that flight response be so automatic has been very, very frustrating uh, because it is so easy to slip into something like that. So so in restarting Little Bean and kind of trying to get the wheels moving again on YouTube, on Instagram, I have a lot of anxiety and stress coming back because I don't know what the future holds for me or for my business, you know, there are a lot of things that go into running a business, including finances and paying bills and paying taxes and all those things, which are inherently stressful. So instead of confronting these things head on, I have been more pushing them to the back and literally procrastinating doing things, especially things like this, cleaning my yarn office, which I recently did post on Instagram about. But, um, you know, avoidance of of dealing with those things. And so I've spent a lot of time in the last few months exploring the reasons why I do it and what, what is the root cause? If it is not, if it is no longer because I am depressed, then what is going on with me? So, so really that's, that's what has been happening behind the scenes. You know, there are a lot of little steps that I, you know, didn't even realize we're there until I had to make those steps and take those steps myself. Um, So for those who struggle with depression or on medication or are really trying to wrap their head around their own mental health, you're not alone at all. And, And it's hard not to compare yourself to other people, especially when you're coming out of a depressive state, because you're just like, well, they seem like they have everything together. And I certainly don't want to share my entire life or every struggle that I have but I don't also want to give off the false impression that I have everything together when I don't and so that's kind of the basis of me talking about this and I hope that you know if it helps somebody it does I know it's not yarn related I know it's not crafting related or whatever but you know I feel like sharing this because I feel like it's very very important no, I have this like one hair that likes to stick out. It's like, I don't know. I don't know what that is. So, um, so that's been one thing that's, that's been a roadblock for me is trying to overcome the dissociative flight procrastination response that I, you know, had been in a pattern of for so long, for years. 
and coming out of it and trying to rebuild those habits into something more sustainable and more healthy. Um, so <laughs> recently I've, you know, kind of taken a deep dive into my, my own self and it may not seem that way, but I really don't have very good self-esteem. Never really have, I've never really hidden it, but I've never really spoken about it here. I have really, really poor self-esteem. And not only for the things that I do, the creative aspects of my life, my body, my every decision I make, pretty much everything, I don't have a good viewpoint of myself. And when I was in a pretty good headspace before I became depressed, I was able to rationalize those things out and just be like, you know what, I'm not going to listen to that. But because of so long being depressed and being in an irrational state, it's harder for me to switch off those negative um, thoughts, those automatic thoughts that I used to be able to just shut them off and, and move past them. So I get fixated on it where I'm feeling stressed out or I feel like I'm not doing something to the best of my ability. So if I can't do it 100% of the way, then I'm just not going to do it at all. So I end up putting things off and I, you know, I, I, I feel like I'm taking one step forward and two steps back, one step forward and two steps back. But I know that it's just a slow pace. Like I have to get myself out but it's not going to be like a light switch. And I have to forgive myself for that and be like, it's okay if it's not a light switch. It's okay if you said you were going to post it once a month and you don't. You know, nobody's going to hate you for that. And if they do, that's okay. You know, you can't control those things. So I've been trying to turn around, um, you know, the negative self-talk and all of those things for myself. And so it's, it's a little bit of a blessing and a curse to have a background in psychology and in, you know, mental health disorders and all of that, because I overthink a lot of things. <laughs> and not that I self-diagnose, but I kind of self-diagnose and I kind of, I take too deep of a look into it. And it, it's almost like I wish I didn't think about those things so often, or I wish I didn't have the knowledge because then it would be easier for me, I think, because I wouldn't be just spending my time spinning my wheels trying to figure out, well, why did this happen? Well, why did this happen? Well, why did this happen? When I could just be like moving forward and trying to move past it. So, so that's been, that's been really the last several months, um, has been a lot of work on myself, really in earnest, trying to post more to social media, provide updates for Little Bean, um, and also, you know, trying to keep up my creative flow because really that's one of my more healthy coping mechanisms, uh, having a creative outlet, having something where I'm doing something with my hands, I'm drawing or I'm painting or I'm making books, which I'll show you in a few minutes, or knitting or spinning or any of those things. They really do give me a lift in terms of my mood. It's just that I have to not frame it in a way where I feel like I have to do this or I have to do it perfectly or I have to do it 100% right now and none of it can wait. Um, so I don't know if that's relatable to any of you, but that's really what's been going on with me. Um, if you do find it relatable, I hope that at least hearing it from someone else might be comforting and it might let you know that you're really not alone and it's okay if you're struggling even after you're out of depression, because you learn a lot. You learn a lot of coping mechanisms to shield yourself from your own emotions when you're overwhelmed. So coming out of it, it's not just getting on a medication and feeling okay when you're, you know, like chemically I'm balanced, but it's more about unlearning all of those automatic behaviors, especially if you spent a long time like I did uncontrolled and not really knowing what to do or failing to get out of it and then continually um, creating those negative coping mechanisms. So <laughs> that's what's been happening with me. Um, yeah, <laughs> and it's summer and we're trying to enjoy the summer. Kids are in camp. Kids are, you know, both out of the house right now. So I'm able to film, which has been great. Um, and I just sat myself down to do it because I knew if I waited another day to film, it's like I wouldn't do it until next week. And I really just wanted to get a video out there um, to you guys. So 
that's, I guess, it for my my mental health spiel this morning. Um, but I did want to show you the things that I've been working on. And also, you know, not all of them are yarn related. Some of them are paper crafts. Um, and some of them are drawing and painting. And some are dyeing. So I don't know. I just have like a smorgasbord of things that I've been doing over the last several months. And so I'll show those to you now. Okay, so I guess I'll start here with some non-yarn related things that I've been working on. So I've shown this book before. I think I showed it back in the last podcast that I, I filmed. But this is a journal that I made for myself, just a regular bullet journal. Um, used cardstock and paper and paperboard because I like to bookbind and it's a hobby that I've recently picked up because what is it that I don't do? Because I really just feel the need to do all of the crafts all the time and I like to learn new things so um, I had created this book last year last fall in October yes it was October 8th to 14th so it was probably the first week of October that I created it and it's just a bullet journal I um made it with cardstock I did a coptic not coptic stitch uh, I forget the type of stitching, but I stitched all of the paper signatures together, so the groups of paper, bound it with uh, PVA book glue, and then I did a hard binding, so I made this out of the um, back, it's, it's, um, what's the, <laughs> it's not cardstock, it's um, press board, what is the word for that, chipboard, that's it, it's the chipboard from the back of um, a paper pad, so like, these covers were from the back of a paper pad and so I lined them with paper. I also sealed them up with tape because I didn't like the feeling of the matte paper. I'm not like um, a matte textured person like frosty glass things like that kind of give me the willies so um, I have this and this says life is tough but so are you and so like this was kind of the message I was trying to give myself. So, so I made this back when I was still not on medication. I still wasn't actively seeing a therapist for my depression so you know that didn't come until after the first of the year this year so but yeah I think it was April maybe it was April when I made my last podcast April May June July so yeah I think so April it's been three months so um because I did write in here April April my, my, I have my therapy appointments listed here but um then I didn't use it at all and it was a shame because I spent a lot of time making it, so I really did want to have it be useful for me. So I started a plan. So at the beginning of July, I started a business plan for myself to kind of organize Little Bean and getting myself back on track. And so I did a YouTube restart. So once a month, like really my goal is once a month. And I know I've said that a lot in the last several videos where I'm like, once a month, once a month, I'm going to do something. But it, I really intend that. It's just all of the steps to get to that have been a little bit overwhelming. So bear with me. I really am trying to make my way through this because this is something I do enjoy. This is another creative outlet that I really like. So I have my business plan that I did, and then I have my therapy homework, which I will not show you. I did a piece of art about depression, which I won't show you because it's a little depressing. Uh, I did some Bob Ross quotes here, and then you know, a little more therapeutic work, like things that I find limiting about myself. So I'm really trying to make this book work for me in whatever way it's going to work. The problem I have is I put um, an unreasonable expectation on myself that I should be using this book for some reason, should, 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 and I should myself into, into oblivion. Um, and then I don't do it. So I'm just going to use the book when I use it not use the book when I don't use it and I'm going to be forgiving and kind to myself when I don't use the book because it, it's okay if I don't use the book and that's something I'm working on so I have you know my tasks here oh yeah and then I read an article about procrastination that I wrote notes about so I'm trying 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 to use this book for the tool that I created it to be to help me better organize and get things rolling in my personal life, in my business life, and all of that. So this is something that I've been working on and actively so. So this was step one. The next thing that I did <laughs> um, 
was, let's see here. I, oh, I made myself a little watercolor palette. So if you have been following me through Instagram, um, you may have seen in my stories that I had been doing some painting lately. And I do have a minor in fine arts and I've done all of the things. I mean, you guys have seen me show ceramics and jewelry making and painting and drawing and all of these things. So I wanted to make myself a little palette that I could have, um, you know, just the main colors that I wanted to use, warm and cool tones, main primary colors, some convenience browns and greens, um, and something that I could just sit on the porch and use or sit on the couch and use and not have this huge palette sitting in front of me. So I made this for myself out of, it was actually a case that some tubed watercolors came in. So I just, you know, glued the half pans in there, filled them up with some paint, um, used some hot glue here to make a divider so I could um, mix colors. Um, 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 I'm out of practice. And then washi tape and a sticker on top. And I was going to write like watercolors or something kind of fun on top. And then I made a swatch card as well for those who are swatch nerds like me. I love swatching. It's really fun. Um, I do it with yarns as well. Uh, yarn colors. So that was something that I did for myself. And then I also decided that because I wasn't using my watercolor paper, I wanted to put it in a better format. So I did some book binding. Uh, if you follow it on Instagram, you might have seen these posts already, but if you haven't followed or seen there, um, I created these two watercolor journals out of my arches pad. So I'm trying to remove obstacles in front of me that are keeping me from using the things that I have and using the tools that I want to use. You know, I, I had this pad of paper and I wasn't using it because it was too large. I don't paint large scale paintings. I like to paint small scale paintings and I don't like having to cut my paper every time I use it. So I was like, I'm just going to put it in books. So I made these books using the chip, my chipboard. I made some fabric. So this was fabric that I had in my closet that I've had for a long time. And I put some heat bond binder on it to make book cloth so that I could glue and do everything I needed to do here. And so it would give a barrier, uh, like a waterproof barrier through the cloth. So here's the books. You can see them. They have a lovely texture. I love woven fabric. Um, and then inside these books, I just used plain gray paper for the inserts. And then the watercolor paper that's in here is just Arches cold pressed watercolor paper. Um, so I cut the pages in half and then bound them. I did a perfect bind. So these are single page signatures. So I just took each page, large sheet, folded it in half, stacked the papers on top of each other. Um, bound them with a homemade book press that I have and <laughs> glued them with PVA glue. So, so these open flat and, you know, it's not going to last forever because, you know, it's just it's glue that's holding it together. But it is hard bound. Um, there's no hard binding on this side. It's just the fabric, ASMR. But, um, so this is just the fabric up here. But you can see the binding, I think, perhaps. Here we go. So it's not perfect, but it was what I needed. And I also got book corners. I think I got these off Amazon uh, pretty cheaply, but I like to put book corners on my homemade books um, just because the corners are the first things that go in books. I just, I care about these too much. So I did do some painting. I did a tree. Ray, <laughs> I always make the trunks of trees so thick, it's crazy. And then I just did a simple beach scene, just for fun, just painting, having fun. Oh, and I also did a swatch chart because who doesn't love a good swatch chart? So these are all the colors that are in my palette and that's kind of the range of colors I get from the 12 that I chose. So for those who care, um, I have Daniel Smith Pyrrole Red, Daniel Smith Quinacridone Rose, Windsor Newton Quinacridone Magenta, which are very similar, uh, the rose and the magenta color, but one is slightly like more reddish and one is slightly more pinkish, so I kept them both because I like them both. 
Uh, Windsor, Newton, Quinacron, and Gold. Daniel Smith, New Gamboge, Yellow. Daniel Smith, um, Hans, Yellow Light. Daniel Smith, uh, French uh, Ultramarine, which is a beautiful granulating pigment. I don't know if um, many of you know about watercolor painting, but when certain pigments are layered on the paper, so like this is the French Ultramarine, you get like a grainy texture. It's a granulating pigment, and it, it gives a little bit of texture and interest to a painting. Um, Daniel Smith Thalo Blue Green, which is a very, very strong blue-green pigment. Uh, Windsor Newton Payne's Gray, which is one of my favorite colors. I love using Payne's Gray. And then I have a few Cotman colors that were in a, a Cotman watercolor pan set that I have. So I took out the Sap Green, the Burnt Sienna, and the Burnt Umber as uh, convenience colors. So this is the range that I have um, in, in the palette that I'm working with right now. So, so I made those. And then because I had made those, I decided I wanted to make two more books. Um, so I also had a pad of, or not a pad, just a stack of B watercolor paper, which is also a cotton uh, watercolor paper. It's a little less expensive than Windsor & Newton, and it's pretty accessible. So I went out to Joanne's Fabric, and I got this canvas. This is, um, it was in the household section. It's an outdoor type canvas. Um, so I wanted something that was woven, that had a nice texture, that was plain, and also that would be, be able to withstand, you know, use and water and all of that stuff. So I made the book cloth again the same way I did before. I used the heat and bond, um, I think it's like the extra strength sheet, but it's a nice thick plastic layer so it bonds to one side and then I just glued the book covers in so again chipboard and then I used a different paper pad so I got some really fun uh, textured paper out of one of uh, those 12 by 12 scrapbooking um, sets and so this one I did with these triangles and then inside it's just perfect bound glued single page signatures of the B paper and then this one has circles which is really fun so I have these as well I did think about selling these but I don't know what I would charge for something like this but it was really they were really fun to make and you know am I really legitimately going to paint on all of this paper probably not maybe I'll gift these to someone I don't know I haven't decided yet what I wanted to do with all of that um Oh, I did want to show you a painting that I forgot to get. It's like right up here. Some of the paintings that I did, I posted on my stories on Instagram. Um, and this one is actually a still life of a little no face uh, figurine that I have that he's stitching. He's doing some knitting on a bench. And I added this sign in, that sign's not in the still life figure, but the still life figure is no face knitting under this lamp. And so I did a little just a little study of him so it's like a cute little illustration of him knitting um, and I used a limited palette for this I just used the Windsor & Newton um, Payne's Gray, Quinacrinone Magenta, Quinacrinone Gold and I also have a Windsor & Newton um, French Ultramarine that I used for this so I had just used those four colors to create this painting which was really fun and I like the challenge of using a limited palette and I, I think I do the same in my dyeing as well. When I'm doing a dye up of yarn, I like to use a limited selection of colors. If I'm dyeing, you know, several skeins to go together or to have a certain feel, then I just choose a limited palette of colors. So then, you know, I just make it from there. Something that I dyed, let me get all these papers. So I was dyeing up, I was dying up the Happy Accidents collection. So for those who've been following along for a little while, you know that I am a big Bob Ross fan, obviously. I like painting and stuff, but um, I wanted to do a fade of paintings and dye colors inspired by those paintings. And so I put it on Instagram, um, a few selections. I had some rows of paintings and I was like, A, B, C, D, which ones do you like? And so row D1, so I, it was five colors. So this is the first painting. And then this is the color that I dyed for that. So it is, I think it's coming up a little more muted because I had to close the shade behind the camera, but 
Um, it is a light warm yellow with brown speckles. So this was the first one. And then the second one is this one. So a little more peach, same tones, but with some peach. So that goes away, thank you. So it's a little peach here. Also with some brown speckles and a light warm yellow. And then this was the third painting. So here is the yarn that came from that. So we have the warm yellow and the peach, but also adding in some darker blue, kind of an ocean type blue. And you can see I matched it pretty well. I did a pretty good job, I think. And then the next color was this one. And so this kind of deepened the palette a little bit. It's a little, a little bit more of a jump uh, from those first three, but I really liked it. And so I took out those peachy tones from the sky, the blues from the water, and then the deep dark greens. And so it has some like grayish muted colors, which I really like. But again, I was using a limited palette of colors. Like I wanted to do that purposefully. And then this was the final one. So this one was a little more difficult for me to do because I didn't want to just do a black yarn um, and then I also wanted it to be able to go with the other yarns that I was dyeing, so I did this. And I think this is okay. If I had to do this over again, I would have shifted this a little bit more orange rather than the lightest tone in this painting. I would have taken it to here, perhaps, but I wanted to make sure that we had that light pop, especially because of all of this lighter yellow color on the dark background. So. I think I did a pretty good job. This is probably my least favorite one of the set, but I like it still. <laughs> um, so yeah, so that's number five. And so I knit up a sock tube to kind of show these colors all together. So this was the first one, the second one, the third one, the fourth one, and the fifth one. So it makes a nice little fade. I mean, here you can see a, lot, a little bit of like patterning because it's in the round, so you're going to notice that, like the striping a little bit more. But I thought it was um, a really lovely fade type set. So if you're interested in them, I still have several sets that are in the shop right now. They're actually marked down as part of my summer sale. So this is what I've been working on. But I do like how this one came out. So this was that last painting. And I think I, I, I really do think I did a pretty good job. I might, I might tweak it if I dye it again, but generally I like how it came out. Okay, so that was the first kind of dye up round. The next thing that I did was create a sticker. So I was doing some art on my iPad because I like to draw, it's relaxing for me, and I wanted to create a new sticker to go you know, in the shop because I already have the little Happy Fiber Friends stickers, which are so stinking adorable. If you haven't gotten them yet, I still have some in the shop. But they're, you know, little stickers of like little woodland or farm creatures using knitting or crochet, which is really cute. So this one I created with a little bit of a different feel. And I wanted it to be like abstract art yarn. That was like the concept I had in my head. And so I created a piece of abstract art in a yarn ball, which I think is really fun. And you can see it's it's hard to draw yarn because you know you want to put in all of this detail, but I just wanted it to have the impression of yarn. So that's that. So I created that. This is also in the shop if you want one. I have I have a stack. I have several that I already printed out. Um, but they're not too big. I put one on the cover of my notebook. I think I put a picture on Instagram about it. Again, I post more to Instagram than I do YouTube. And I have to stop playing with my hair. Oh my gosh. <sighs> okay. So the last thing that I did was, the last major dye up I did was this fluorescent set. So let's put it in order because why not? So this little set... I named my favorite highlighters because you all know if you have a favorite highlighter color it immediately gets dirty. <laughs> Swipe it across uh, your sheet of paper and soon enough you have little specks of pen all over it. So that was the basis behind these. I wanted to do kind of a tonal um, 
a tonal feel, but a little bit adulterated, like not just a plain tonal because I didn't want that. So these kind of have um, gray, gray, black, and kind of orange specks on there just to kind of make the yarn feel and look a little bit distressed. So yeah, so I named this my favorite highlighter set and then this was the limited palette that I used to create the yarns I'm going to show you. So this is in a mini skein set as a set itself and I think I also, so I put up some as a set and then I also put these up individually. So I have several sets and then I have several of them just as individual mini skeins. So if you like a particular color, you can just get it. So they're all pretty saturated. Um, this teal one is a little more muted, but it's still very saturated. It's not um, exactly fluorescent, but I didn't really aim for it to be. So the yarns here that I dyed, I pulled inspiration from a sock blank I dyed a while back. So I created a speckled yarn based on that um, based on that sock blank. So it was the Frankly Lisa I Don't Give a Damn, uh, which was a play on Lisa Frank because I loved Lisa Frank as a kid. Um, child of the 90s, you know, late 80s, early 90s, and that was my jam. So I created a speckled skein that is Frankly Lisa I Don't Give a Damn, and I kind of just pulled the same types of colors that I used to dye that sock blank and made a speckled skein. So the, these are also the colors that are in there, so these type of colors. And these were made with some fluorescent dyes, some non-fluorescent dyes as well. So then I wanted to kind of pull out um, different colors. So that one kind of has all the colors, and so I wanted to have a green one. So this one I named Sour Apple, which was one of my favorite candies, candy flavors um, in all candies. Pop Rocks, Jolly Ranchers, I loved Sour Apple. So this is Sour Apple. It is, you know, speckled with a fluorescent green and then some deeper blues. I think this is like called extreme blue or something. I, it was a different color. It was a color that I don't use all that often. So it's nice, deep, but then when it's lighter, it's kind of like this bluish green. I liked it a lot. Uh, and then this one I named Rock Candy. Uh, this was one of my most favorite treats to get. So when we went on field trips as a kid, and you'd go to the gift shops, you know, we used to go to like Sturbridge Village or we'd go, you know, to like all those, you know, reenactment like Plymouth Plantation. So we would go on these field trips, but we would also always go into the um, gift shops and I would always want to buy rock candy. That was the one thing I wanted from every field trip was rock candy. And so um, I dyed these with the colors of rock candy in mind. So I, I, it's a fluorescent pinks and also blue in there because those were the colors of rock candy. Um, and then this one is called Electric Cantaloupe. So I wasn't quite sure what to name this one. Um, I threw around a bunch of ideas, but I, I eventually settled on Electric Cantaloupe because it is a fluorescent orange. It is bright. I mean, I don't know how well this is picking up on the camera in terms of fluorescence, but it is pretty bright. So, um, so yeah, cantaloupe's one of my favorite summer melons. <laughs> it is my favorite summer fruit, but I wanted to kind of give it life in yarn. So electric cantaloupe. And so again, these are kind of like these colors are in, are in this skein as well. And then I wanted something neutral to go with everything because I typically don't like using fluorescent yarns. They're not always my most favorite. I know a lot of people like them. I think they're cheerful to look at and I like them in the summertime and springtime when you're kind of coming out of the funk, but I needed something <laughs> to ground it all. So I created this color, which is called Midnight Sky. And this is a dark blue-black tonal. Um, it is... It really looks like a midnight sky. It is, this is probably the lightest part of the, the tonal skein here, but it's it's really just a deep, dark blue-black. I mean, there's no other way to describe it. And these also kind of reminded me of fireworks, because I, I dyed these around the, f the 4th of July, I believe. So I was like, ooh, maybe I could name them like fireworks names, but that's what it made me, made me think of, so. 
I had a lot of fun dyeing these. Um, you know, it was kind of refreshing to dye such colorful yarn. And I, you know, I had a lot of comfort in that uh, in terms of like, it made me feel good, it made my anxiety kind of dissipate a little bit. Okay, so then the last things that I've been really working on was oh, some spinning. So this was fiber that was sitting on my Swift for the Swift on my bobbin for the longest time. So back in the winter, I think was the last time I spun, I was just trying to loosen up because I was having trouble coping, obviously, but I was like so done with everything that I was trying to just experiment and do something different with the fiber I was spinning. So instead of spinning finely, which is what I normally do, I was like, okay, I'm just going to spin like a chunky single. So that's what I did. And I finished it up this week, took it off the bobbin. I don't even know how many yards are in here, but this was the end of a braid that I had from um, Snurb Yarn. If you've never followed Brunchivia Boone, she's great. She's one of my favorite dyers of all time, yarn and fiber, and I often try and catch her updates for fiber because I love everything about the things that she dyes. So um, if you've never checked her out, you should, but this was the end of a braid from that. And I believe, I don't know if I should, I probably did show you I don't know if you can see it right up there in the corner. That's that's the end of this, the other end of this. It was what was, I took that off the, um, I took it off the bobbin and I just plied it up. So like that corner one plus this is 100 grams of fiber. And then I did just start um, spinning again back to my normal um, thin. I'll put the picture up here. I just posted this morning, I was spinning out on the um, porch because it was nice and cool and sunny and the breeze was coming in from the ocean so it was just perfect. But back to my thin spin because that's really my jam. I really love a thin spin. So I am doing a type of fractal, I think is what it's called, but I'm not two plying a fractal. I am going to chain ply it, but the way I divided it was I divided the braid in half so I just divided it down the middle and then I took I took that half and I split off a third and then I split this into thirds and then those thirds into thirds. So it was like, you know, you know, like a fractal. Like it, it's like less and less and less and less. So um, hopefully it'll come up with some interesting striping and kind of gradation where it'll be like longer color repeats and then going into shorter and shorter and shorter color repeats. So I don't know how it's going to turn out, but I'm just having fun doing it. I kind of liked that I pulled the fiber apart. Normally I don't. Normally I just spin right from the braid. But it's kind of given me those little steps that I need to just achieve whatever I wanted. So I'm not so worried about, you know, doing the whole thing at once or like feeling like, oh, I'm spinning for hours and I didn't accomplish anything. You know, I have those little, you know, little, little bundles of fiber. I have some over there. I don't know. I can't really reach them. They're a little bit far. But just like little bundles of fiber. So it's like, you know, a third of a third of a third of a third of the braid. And I can sit and spin it for, you know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, and then be done with that little section. So it makes things feel a little more attainable, a little less overwhelming. And I've been enjoying that about it. Mm, let's see what else. Oh, I forgot. I forgot. I have the change of shop. Eee! So, well, first... Um, I haven't done a lot of knitting, but I, I did knit on this shawl. I also knit on a pair of socks, but um, not in any like capacity that's like a lot of progress. So the last time, uh, don't come out, Needle. Uh, the last time you guys saw this shawl, I don't even think I had come to section D yet. I think I was still somewhere in the green part of section C. I think I was like somewhere down here. You can't even see this whole thing on camera. It's gigantic. But this is the Change of Shawl. It's a pattern by Mina Phillip, who is the knitting expat here on YouTube. She is one of my favorite designers. I love her so much. She's so sweet. She's sweet in person. She's also a great designer. She designs things 
and explains things so well in her patterns. Like I just, you know, like when you have a teacher, you just like jive with, you're like, yeah, I get it. I get it. You, you make it easy for me. So it's like when I started knitting, I started knitting on her patterns. And for some reason, it's just like her patterns speak to me. Like I understand them so well. I never have any questions. Like, you know, it's easy for me to figure things out. If I have a question on it, you know, it's easy to read sectioned off like even though this project is huge it is a four skein shawl project um and it uses all four skeins all of the yarn and it's huge um it, it is not so bad so this is the center which is the beginning then you have section so this is a then this is section b and then section c goes all the way out. So on the camera, it's hard to see because these tones are pretty similar in terms of value, but it goes through a green gradient there and then into blue. And then I just turned to do section D. So it ends up being a rectangular shawl with points at the end. So this is the end of the shawl. And on hers, I believe she put tassels, but it it is huge and I love it. And I love the colors and it makes me feel happy. So I just work on it when I can, put it down when I'm not working on it, and I'm forgiving myself if I don't work on it. So um, I did dye up kits for this. It is a big project. I'm interested to dye kits again because this was really fun to dye, but I would probably only dye the black or I would dye a much lighter gray than this um, just to give more of a contrast in values, especially along the mid-tones, like the mid-tone greens, which shows up okay, but it's not, it's, it's not perfect. <laughs> oh, struggles, but um, <laughs> I think I would just tweak it just a little bit, but I liked the rainbow that I created on the gradients. So I did two identical gradients. So it was, you know, two double knit soft blanks that were dyed, you know, at the same time. So you have identical gradients for each side of the shawl. So you're not weaving in ends for mini skeins. I thought it was a really fun idea. I've been enjoying knitting on it because I don't have to think about like switching colors every few rows. Although some people like that and that's great. Um, so I dyed up you know, I'll put a picture or something if I can find a picture, but I dyed up, you know, two tonals and then two 100 gram gradients that were identical. So you'd have like the perfect identical shawl. So you could work it in whichever way you wanted. You could work it just from like Roy G. Biv, which is what I'm doing here, or pink G. Biv. <laughs> this has pink instead of red. Um, it's more of like a strawberry pink, it's like a strawberry red color. It's not, it's not exactly red. Um, but yeah, going all the way into purple, and so I should make it to the purple. <laughs> this is like the most awkward thing. So this is where I'm at in the gradient. So you can see I'm on like this aqua section and I should make it into some of the purple color. Um, I was reading on her group. So she had a group uh, set up for a knit along on the change of shawl, which obviously I did not complete. But I was, um, people were talking about like how much in weight they were using per section. And so I kind of used that as a guide for me on like when to switch colors or when to, um, when to stop one gradient ball and then begin the next gradient ball. Sitting here for quite some time. Um, I know this is a long video. If you've stuck with me this far, thank you so much. I hope you've enjoyed this update. So the last thing I did in the time that I hadn't been filming and hadn't been doing anything was really reorganizing this room. So if you notice behind me, the yarn is in the closet. I'd like to kind of get my racks set up so it lines the closet. Um, I don't have a ton of room in this room. This is, you know, just a normal bedroom sized room for all of my yarn supplies, my dyeing supplies, my, you know, preparation supplies. So my skein winder, I have my Cricut in here, I have my heating plates in here. And, um, you know, I spent a lot of time in here, little by little, going through everything, purging out, you know, old, like papers and stuff that I didn't need anymore, things that end up strewn on the floor. And, I got some shelving in here. I kind of rearranged the room and then I also I sold my steam trays So I'm not sure which update I talked about the steam trays Perhaps I talked about them in the January podcast, although I can't remember exactly but I purchased steam trays because I moved my dye studio from the kitchen to here. So this is where 
you know, all of my things are now. And I, I thought, okay, I should just upgrade to a steam tray instead of using burners because, you know, it'll be better, it'll be a little, maybe it'll be faster or it'll be more efficient and I can just pull pans out, put pans on, and I'm not worried about like a hot burner on my work surface. But I tried several times. I tried, I, I mean, I used the burner for the trunk show that I did for uh, Plymouth Harbor Knits. I dyed up a whole bunch of things in there. You know, some of these Bob Ross colorways were dyed in there. Some of the colorways that are still not even in the shop that are on the shelf were dyed in there. But it was the pacing and the cumbersome nature of, of these steam trays. So if you've never seen like a steam table, it's it's just, you know, it fits a full size catering tray, which is kind of what I die in, those long rectangular pans. So it's it's like what you would see, you know, at a buffet if they had like individual tr like table. I'll just put a picture. Here's what it looked like. But I had two of them and they were so large, they took up half of the table that you're sitting on right now, the, my old kitchen table. And there was nowhere really good for me to store them. So they just sat on the table taking up workspace, which I found very frustrating and stressful and then also I was used to a certain pace when I was dying in my kitchen I was dying directly on the burners and I had a rhythm for how I would die and prep and put things in and take things out and I knew how long things took to come to temperature to set you know the whole nine like everything so when I had bought these steam tables I really underestimated how much that would change for me and how much I wouldn't like it. I, I really thought I would be able to adjust just fine because usually I can adjust to whatever circumstance I'm in, but for some reason it became this gigantic obstacle for dying for me that I never wanted to die anymore because I didn't like the steam tray so much. And it was stressful for me because I was like, well, I don't want to die in the kitchen anymore. I don't like dying in the kitchen. You know, I don't like to mix stuff like this with places where I'm going to be preparing food. You know, I like things to be clean. And it's a lot of work to die in the kitchen because you have that risk of contamination. So, like, I take things very seriously. And so having these steam trays in here, it was taking so long. And I didn't like it so much. And, like, I didn't know the timing. So I was like, you know what? I'm cleaning this room out. I'm just going to sell these steam trays because they're not getting used and somebody else could definitely use these. I mean, I'm part of a business group on Facebook for independent dyers and I was like, I'm definitely just going to post these. They've barely been used at all. So sure enough, somebody was like, sure, I'll take these off your hands. She actually was in Massachusetts as well. So we were able to meet and, you know, exchange the trays. <laughs> I was like, here you go. I hope that you enjoy these steam tables. I didn't like them, but they work great. Um, and a lot of dyers do use them and do love them. So, you know, it's just my own personal preference. I ended up going out and getting, you know, just some regular hot plate burners so that I can put my, um, put my trays on them. And also I'm able to do mini skeins. So I don't like to dye literally just threw the yarn it just almost hit the camera that was kind of funny okay so I don't like to dye mini skeins in the large steam trays I'm not a large volume dyer I dye you know small dye lots four to eight skeins maximum for per colorway and when I dye mini skeins I, I dye even fewer of them because you know most people are buying one or two or they're buying a set of five so I have you know specific numbers that I like to dye all at once and putting you know 25 mini skeins which is not all that much into a large full-size steam pan like I just didn't like it it just took a long time you know I don't have enough movement in the pan like when I had it on the burner I could do it in the large pans or I would put one large pan on two burners and then I would have two smaller pots so that I could do tonal mini skeins and then I would use the large pan so I could speckle so it was just like it was too much of a disruption to the workflow that I normally have so I was like you know what I'm not going to be afraid to sell these like there's nothing wrong with selling them like somebody else is going to use them and just love them like but it's just not me and that's okay so I have to like forgive myself for that like I'm not those are the things that would weigh on me a lot like to give an example 
I would feel guilty that I'm selling them. And then I would feel like, well, I just failed at something, even though logically I didn't fail at anything. It was just, it's just that internal automatic dialogue. So sold them, felt good about it, got the steam, the, the burners. So now I have a setup that I'm more happy with. I rearranged the room, so I'm much more happy with it. It's much more comfortable in here. I have a better flow, a workflow for those who have their own studio space or for those who are in their kitchen or or whatever. However you're working, you have a workflow where your undyed materials are, where you're dyeing, where you're drying, you know, everything has a place and usually it's in some kind of sequence. And so before I just didn't have any sense of what was going to happen because I wasn't even using the space. And so now I feel like I have a good use of the space. I have a good flow around the room. So it makes me feel so much better. So, <laughs> so yeah, that was the other big project was this room <laughs> and I rearranged a lot I moved my fish tank over I don't know you can't really you can like barely see like right there um my fish tank that was like on a shelf over here I moved it over there so it's like as far away from dying as possible it's also covered so I'm not worried about you know contamination getting into the fish tank which is nice it's just a small five gallon um tank um but yeah I just I moved all my mini skeins in here I moved my racks into the closets and I have more usable floor space. I just am feeling pretty good. I'm feeling pretty good about all of this. Okay, so I am just going to cut it off here. This has been a very long update podcast. I hope that you guys enjoyed it. Um, it's taken a lot for me to get to this point to film, so I hope that you appreciate the effort at least. Um, and I hope that you'll stick around for more videos because truly I am trying to get out a video once a month, whether it's just a podcast. I do have a, a list. I have a queue of videos that I plan to film. So if you have ideas for videos that you want to see, just pop them in the comment section down below. If you're not subscribed and you'd like to be, just hit subscribe down below and make sure you're ticking the bell icon and pinging for all notifications because again YouTube has changed the algorithms and changed the way they notify uh, viewers again so um, so there's that for you so if you do want to get notified make sure you are clicking the bell and clicking to hear notifications for videos but other than that I hope that you guys are enjoying your summer I hope that you enjoy the rest of it and I hope that you're taking care of yourself as well and making time um, to do things that matter to you and that you're taking time to, to care about yourself because that's something I'm focusing on and I hope that you guys are as well. Um, so yeah, so I'll see you guys when I see you next. Um, and if that's in a month, then it's in a month. And if it's not, that's okay too, I guess. I don't know. Um, but I'll see you guys in my next video. Bye.